Hi again, everyone. Gary Digit Williams here on Boxing Along the Beltway. Our news and notes for this week. And uh, as we say every week, a lot going on and a lot has gone on this past weekend and into last couple of days. And uh, a lot more going on later on this week. So what we're going to do this week, we're going to recap some of the recent Beltway boxing action over this past weekend. And actually, as we as we record this, uh, happened uh, Tuesday night. Uh, some more boxing took place featuring our Beltway boxers. And, of course, we'll, we'll preview uh, the big one coming up this Saturday between Dominic Wade and Gennady Golovkin. And we'll look ahead to next Saturday with a couple of big cards on Saturday, April 30th. And, of course, this weekend, Gary Russell Jr. successfully defended his WBC featherweight title, second-round knockout over Patrick the Punisher Highland of Dublin, Ireland. And, you know, a lot of folks in the boxing world, they're criticizing Russell again. Now, Russell um, had not fought in a year, was scheduled to fight Oscar Eskandone, who's now the interim featherweight champion, and maybe down the road they'll meet each other. But uh, he faced a guy in Patrick Highland who, who was going through a lot. His father had passed away not too long ago, um, and... He wasn't in Russell's class. Very true. I mean, it, it is true. I mean, he, Russell did exactly what he normally would do in a situation like that. The fast hands led to the power, which led to Russell dropping uh, and overpowering Highland on on route to the victory. And Russell now 27 and 1, 16 KOs. Highland drops 31 and 2, 15 KOs. Why do people expect Russell? To come after a year's absence, and he was in. See, see, what people are not saying about his absence of a year was that he was injured during that time. A lot of people are forgetting that. And you expect him to come not 100% healthy and go into a bout against Lee Selby or Leo Santa Cruz or a rematch against Vasily Lomachenko. No one's going to do that, folks. And you got a lot of boxing podcasts out there who are saying, well, he's not fighting anybody and he and he he's he's avoiding anybody. He's not avoiding anybody, folks. But for the last year, Gary Russell Jr. has been hurt. That is why the Eskandome fight was postponed and canceled technically in the first place. And people don't understand that. And people people are, are waving him. Yeah, we want to see him against the top flight. And I think and you listen to Russell. Yes, he's talking about Lomachenko, but he's also saying he'll fight Lee Selby. He's also saying he'll fight Leo Santa Cruz. I mean, they're Abnomaris. He'll fight these guys. He'll go up against these guys. And if he does want to fight only four or five times and then hang it up, so be it. You've got other, other athletes in other sports who are getting out of it early with the money and gone. And Gary Russell Jr. has a family, a young family. Plus, he has his brothers as well. He he looks after as well, along with his father and and his mother as well. And so you, you look at that situation and you wonder why people are criticizing him. And I'm talking about people in the Beltway this time. I know people outside. Well, technically, there's one people, I won't mention them, but but they live in the area. And yeah, they're criticizing him. But they're not the only ones. I'm not blaming them. But it's just ridiculous that he is getting so much bad press. But yet putting on these great performances that everybody should enjoy. And and that and that's what I don't understand. But yeah, he'll fight the Lee Selby's. He'll fight the Leo Santa Cruz's. He'll fight these guys. They just don't want to. It's not going to come when everybody wants it to come. It'll come on the Russell's home own time. And if you know anything about the Russell family, they do things their way. And it's led to one world champion and four national golden gloves and two of their their brothers making the olympic team you can't argue with success simple as that speaking of one of the brothers not the one who made the olympic team that's antoine but russell's other younger brother antonio he began the 2016 campaign on the very same card at the foxwoods in mashantucky connecticut he scored a second round knockout over alberto serna of mexico now antonio russell of course he was the 2015 beltway boxing rookie of the year and he dropped serna twice with right hooks in the first round and landed a quick combination, finished about 39 seconds of the second round. Antonio Russell, now 6-0-5 KOs. Cerna is 2-5 and five with 1 KO. So that's what took place at the Foxwood. And, of course, the Gary Russell Jr. bout was shown on Showtime. And it was also shown on Showtime the very same time in and about 
that Malik Iceman Hawkins, the welterweight out of Baltimore, was on the CBS Sports Network, and he really just punished Arrow the Spider Sydney of New Orleans, Louisiana. Six-round TKO there. That was at the D Hotel Casino in Las Vegas, Nevada. Hawkins continually kept Sydney. He was off balance the entire night. Uh, Hawkins landed brutal left jabs. He landed some right hooks. And my, one of my all-time favorite announcers in any business, any athletic business, did the call on this one. And that's, of course, the legendary pro wrestling announcer, Jim Ross, good old JR. And he had a great line Saturday night. He said that Sydney was in the corner so much, thanks to Hawkins' pressure, that Sydney would have to pay property tax. I think that was just a great line. I'm sorry. I, I loved that line. And then Hawkins just, just took... Sydney out with a crushing right uppercut. Sydney just dropped to the canvas. Referee Jay Nady, he stopped about at 102 of the sixth round. Hawkins is down 7 0, 6 KOs. Sydney falls to 6 2 and 2 with 2 KOs. So another great performance. This is a guy, I tell you, Upton Boxing Gym over there in, in Baltimore. That's where Javante Davis comes out of. And Malik Iceman Hawkins came out, comes out of that gym as well. Um, they they've got something really going over there um and uh kobe madison the new heavyweight is out of there as well uh so it, it's going to be interesting to see what goes on um what's continue going on up upton boxing gym by the way uh this note about upton boxing gym they are hosting the baltimore version of the junior olympics um junior olympic preliminaries uh this saturday april 23rd at the upton boxing center that's 100 pennsylvania avenue in baltimore and uh that's where the baltimore version of the uh junior olympics will be and then the regional junior olympics will be held in salisbury may 13th through the 15th so just wanted to add that in as well meanwhile in mexico on saturday at the gimnasio nuevo leon unido in monterey mexico i'm just gonna start calling them the ages wonder WBO, former WBO junior welterweight champion Demarcus Chop Chop Corley lost a 12-round majority decision. I want to say that again. A 12-round majority decision to Adrian Diamante Estrella out of Monterey. Now, Estrella is the interim WBC Latino lightweight champion, and he's ranked number 10 by the WBC. And Corley managed to get a majority decision against this guy. And what was interesting in the bout, according to the reports, um, the bout had open scoring. So everybody in the arena knew the scores. And at one point, this was after eight rounds, Corley was down 80-72, 77-76, and 78-74 to Australia. That was after eight rounds. Then the ninth round, Corley dropped Estrella with a right hand. And it was a beautiful shot, too. Beautiful shot. Estrella managed to survive that round and basically, according to reports, was on his bicycle pretty much for the bulk of the rest of the fight. And the end of the scores, one judge had it a draw, 114-114. The other two judges had it 117-112, 116-111 for Estrella. Corley now falls to 44-27-1, 26 KOs. Estrella 26-1, 23 KOs. Now, Corley is 41 years old. And he continues to test top prospects. You don't even want to call him a gatekeeper because he comes very close to winning. If you're not on your A game, and that's the that I guess that may be the the definition of someone who is a quote unquote gatekeeper. That if the hot prospect is not on his game, he'll lose. And it's happened before. This happened uh, for Corley in about in Denmark, we talked about, where he, the guy was 11 0, and Corley stopped him. So Corley is still viable enough to test your prospects. It's not a situation where they'll give your prospects some work. But he won't win. We haven't gotten there. We're in a situation where he'll test your prospect. Corley will test your prospect. But if you're not on your A game, you will lose. And it almost happened to Adrian Estrella. And and that is the amazing situation about the Ageless Wonder 
Demarcus Chop Chop Corley because he still is very viable, still can get some good paydays. He may never get a world title shot again, but the fact is he's going to make some good money because any prospect who wants to see where they are in this business in the 135 pound division, which is where this fight was, lightweight division, has to, and I mean truly has to see the Marcus Chop Chop calling. There's no question about that in my mind. Not at this stage. He he is he has done outstandingly well, and he is just uh, tremendous on what he is doing. And it's just amazing to see what goes on here. So. Chop Chop Corley in losing effort, but does an outstanding job. So that was Saturday's action. Now we move to this this past Tuesday's action, where Emmanuel Aline, out of Richmond, Virginia, he's a middleweight. He remained undefeated with an eight round unanimous decision over Jonathan Zapata of the Bronx, New York, in a nationally televised bout that was on FS1, Fox Sports 1, from the Sands Bethlehem Event Center in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. Now, as I said earlier, as we were previewing this bout last week, the two time Jonathan Zapata were in was in the area was at uh, the North Hall Eastern Market and at the ABC Sports Complex in Springfield, Virginia, both, I believe, on Jetta Promotions cards. And I missed both of them. And I wish I hadn't now because <laughs> despite being out for a year, Jonathan Zapata out of the Bronx, New York, was incredibly tough. For Emmanuel Aline. Aline pretty much dominated the fight, especially in the last, I'd say, six to eight rounds. He went up winning about 79, 73 across the board, but he took some shots from Cepeda. He gave Cepeda a lot of shots, and Cepeda wasn't going anywhere. He, he wobbled a little bit, but he didn't fall down as the old Weebles used to used to do back in the day. But it, it was a tremendous situation. And you look at Aline now. His last two bouts were a split decision win, followed by a tough eight eight round division win, eight eight round uh, unanimous decision, six round unanimous decision, six round split decision. I'm sorry, six round split decision and an eight round unanimous decision. In his last two bouts. That means Aline fighting a lot of tough for competition, and as good as he did look against in both situations, I thought he looked good in both bouts. His last two bouts. He knows now. He has to know. And George Peterson, his, his wonderful trainer, has to know that Liam's got to step up the business a little bit now. As he moves into the middleweight division, close, you know, closer to, to regional and, and world titles, uh, Emmanuel Liam's got to step up a little bit because he's 16 and 09 KOs now, and he is fighting some really quality uh, competition. There's no doubt about that. So, we to see how he continues in, in his uh, career. Now, as we record this, uh, Alantes Fox was scheduled to compete tonight at the uh, Hilton Westchester Hotel in Rybrook, New York. However, uh, his scheduled opponent, a guy by the name of Josue Ovando, um, could not get cleared by the doctor. And the reason being, apparently within the last few hours after the weigh-in, I guess the results from his doctor's exam came back. And they said he had a brain tumor. And um, that is definitely nothing to play with, even if you're not a fighter. And I can say that from personal experience, because a couple of years ago, I had a benign tumor in my head. And uh, as far as I know, it's still there, uh, but it's not doing any damage, thank goodness. But So I can somewhat sympathize with this, with, with the Jose Vando, understand where he's coming from. But... You know, he obviously he could not fight. So we just want to wish our blessings on Josue Ovando and his family, of course, because the family has to go through this, too, to figure out what's going on. They, they, they're, they're dealing with this as well. So we wish him the best. And thank goodness the doctors, quite frankly, found this in time. Because if we didn't know this prior to the bout, who knows what would have happened. And that's, and that's what people are trying to do to make this sport safer. And... uh and you look at that situation, just happy that the doctors were able to find out that Ovando uh, has this situation. And we pray that he gets to it. No question about that. So Alantes Fox will not be fighting tonight in um, Westchester, at the Hilton Westchester in Rybrook, New York. 
Now, let's turn our attention to next. Oh, before we do that, we can't, can't, can't go any further. How can we forget what comes up this Saturday? And that's, of course, Dominique Wade taking on Gennady Golovkin at the Foreman in Inglewood, California. Uh, about is, is on HBO uh, Championship World Championship Boxing. Now, again, listening to a lot of podcasts, boxing podcasts around the country, you know, obviously people think that Dominic Wade won't last anywhere from four to six rounds with Golovkin. And that is the prevalent thought and probably the more intelligent thought on the surface. I'll say this, though. I won't say if anybody can do it, Dominic Wade can. I, I'm not sure that's completely true. But the Dominic Wade I know would not roll, roll over and play that. He will not go into this this bout, you know, in a no lose situation. He wants to win it. He wants to put himself on the mainstream. There's no question about that. And you know, people are blaming Golovkin for taking this bout. They they they, they tend to forget that Billy Joe Saunders didn't want this bout, and. The guy that was scheduled to be Golovkin's mandatory, Toriano Johnson, was injured. But the key is that Golovkin, that Billy Joe Saunders at that time, when the bout was offered to, offered to him, did not want it. There's nothing Triple G could do about that. So he took the next bout that was available, and it just happened to be Dominic Wade, who was sitting at number three in the world. And do you expect, seriously, do you expect Dominic Wade to not take a bout like that? You, you, you got to wonder the mentality of some people who, who, who call themselves so-called boxing writers in this area, in this country, I should say. Why would he not take that? As I've said from the, from the day this bout was announced, this is a no-lose situation for Dominique Wade. If he loses, one he's supposed to, and two, he's just 18 and one. And if he looks good and loses, he gets major paydays. If he wins, he gets, I guess for lack of a better term, major, major paydays. So why are people complaining about this? I, I guess maybe this is the, the Homer in me that wants to see Dominic Wade succeed and believes he has a chance in doing it. Okay? You know, again, the smart money, no, he doesn't have a chance. No, he's going to get knocked out within six rounds. But the fact is, Wade stepped up and took the bout. The WBO middleweight champion, Billy Joe Saunders, can't say that. And now Wade is ranked in all four of the major governing bodies last I looked. Wade, especially if he has a good performance, he should be the next to challenge Saunders and see what Saunders has to say. So you you, you, you got to wonder about that. It, it's, it's just ridiculous, you know. And again, it, it, it's the smart money, I mean, I don't see, quite frankly, other than the Dominic Wade I do know, I don't see a lot of ways that, that he beats Golovkin. Golovkin's just that good. There's no question about that. But again, Dominic Wade's not going to roll over and play that and play that. And why and Golovkin has been talking about so many other things other than Dominic Wade. You know, he's talking about Canelo Alvarez. He's talking about this person and that person. And Wade's conversation, the only thing about Wade he's saying is that I don't know who Dominic Wade is. My biggest my biggest hope is that Golovkin finds out on Saturday. My biggest fear is that he ends up being like Charles, that Wade ends up being like Charles Martin did against Anthony Joshua last week and not last two rounds. But if Golovkin ends up finding out who Wade is the hard way, who knows? But it's still worth watching, folks, despite what all these naysayers say. Still a good bout to watch. That's Saturday, April 23rd from the Forum, Inglewood, California on HBO. Now let's turn our attention to the two big cards that are taking place at the 
in in the area, in the Beltway area, on Saturday, April 30th, one week from Saturday. Uh, of course, the pro show is the uh, show of the DC Army. That's the Mayweather promotion show. The, of course, the double main event is the two battle, battles for the World Super mid- t- Middleweight titles for the WBC crown. Badu Jack takes on Lucien Boutte, former world champion Lucien Boutte. And for the IBF title, James DeGale battles Rogelio Medina. Now, the two winners of that car or those bouts are supposed to meet each other for unification. So we'll see if that takes place. Now, the undercard. The undercard as we see it right now, quite frankly, doesn't have a whole lot for the beltway. It's 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 a weird situation because we have a couple of people who are training out of the beltway. We have one person who was born in the Beltway but moved out of the area when he when she was uh, when she was eight years old. We have one young man making his pro debut who's fought in the Beltway as an amateur, and another person out of Richmond, Virginia, who um, who uh, has, has trained a lot in the Beltway over the last few years. So let's go around this uh, real quickly. Uh, two guys that fought on the March fifth card at the. Um, at the DC Armory, we turn to the Armory, and they're both opponents again. Talk about Joshua Okine and Samuel Amwako. Uh, actually, Samuel Amwako did not fight at the uh, Armory, but he did fight uh, Mike Yes Indeed Reed the week prior to that uh, in uh, in Reed's last bout. But Amwako was scheduled to take on a, a car about in this on the Tony Thompson Luis Ortiz card, but was not there. But he's on this card. He'll take on Sharif the Lion Boguer out of Las Vegas, Nevada. In about uh, Boguer is uh, twenty-seven and zero. He's a he's a good one, a good middleweight there. Now Joshua Okine did fight on the uh, on the. Um, I'm sorry, M. Walker's a, a super lightweight. Excuse me. Joshua Okine is a middleweight, and he'll take on Christopher Pearson out of Ohio. Uh, and Okine uh, lost his bout at the uh, at the uh, DC Army back on March the fifth. So both of those guys have been training out of Silver Spring, Maryland. So that's a, that's sort of a a um, connection to the Beltway. The other connection, one of the other connections, is a young lady by the name of La- Latandria. It's, it's either Latandria or Latandria Jones. We have to figure out what her, uh, how to pronounce her name. And she'll take on Kamika Slade. I'm not exactly sure where Kamika Slade is from. She's making a pro debut. They debut. Now, Latandria La- La- Jones, we'll, we'll, we'll go with that for right now, unless that's changed, is originally from Washington, D.C. She was born here, but she moved to South Carolina at the age of eight and now trains out of the Mayweather gym in Las Vegas. She's 2-0, 1 KO. Um, Apparently a very good, in fact, I think she may be the first uh, female to turn pro out of the Mayweather gym in Las Vegas. So uh, she's happy. I'm reading some press clippings and uh, she is very happy to be back home. She hasn't been home pretty frequently. I believe she still has family here, but uh, she was born in D.C. So she is about as close to the Beltway box as we have here, other than Keegan Grove, who we talked about uh a couple weeks ago, Keegan Grove, who actually lives in West Virginia, but has trained here for years uh, out of the old school gym. Uh, he makes his pro debut in this card. He's the latest Al Heyman signee. And so he will be uh, on this card. He's actually going to be trained by George Peterson, who trains uh, who trains um, the Aleem brothers. And speaking of the Aleem brothers, Moshe Aleem returns, the older brother of Emmanuel Aleem. Uh, Aleem is 402 KOs, but he has not fought. It'll be almost two years. It'll be a little bit more than two years since he last stepped into a ring. He'll take on Martez Jackson, who is two and one, one KO. And so that'll be a, uh, uh, interesting card there. So Moshe gets a chance to duplicate what his brother did this past week. And so that's part of the card for the, uh, Saturday, April 30th show. We'll, we'll give you more detail on that next week. When we do our full preview of this this card coming up on Saturday, April 30th at the D.C. Army. Now, for your amateur fans, of course, the Golden Gloves Regionals, Washington Golden Gloves Regional, take place at Rosecroft Raceway on April 30th. And uh, there's some really interesting bouts on this card. We haven't put up the the, uh, situation yet. 
the uh, bout sheet yet, but I have it in my hand. And there's some interesting bouts in it. Of course, this makes this marks D.C., Maryland, and Delaware against Virginia and North Carolina. So let's look at the open real quickly. A couple of region already um, unopposed champions. One of them will be Malik Jackson at 114 pounds. He'll go to the Nationals in Salt Lake City, and he will represent the D.C. region in that situation, 114 pounds. Rashid Wright from D.C. at 108 pounds will also be involved with the um, regionals in D.C. as well. Now, I think the bout of the night may be in 165 pounds. And I tell you, I wish I could really see this one because I think this is going to be a very good bout. It'll match Tavon Body out of Burtonsville, Maryland against Troy Isley out of Alexandria, Virginia. Now, you're talking about two very accomplished amateur boxers uh, in this area and in this region. These two are going to go at it. This this could be a very good bout. Uh, Tavon Body, of course, is the two-time um, regional champion at 165 pounds. And Troy Isley, I believe this is maybe his first time at 165. And he, of course, won the... the uh, Virginia, North Carolina um, championships this past week in Wilmington, North Carolina. And that should be a very good bout at 165 pounds. Tavon Body out of uh, Burtonsville, Maryland, taking on Troy Isley of Alexander, Virginia. Uh, 141 pounds, Tariq Irby of Oxen Hill, Maryland, will take on Jelante Cole out of Burke, Virginia. That should be a good one as well. Uh, Cole has has also trained in the district at one point, now moved out to, to Burke, Virginia. I believe he trains with uh, Kay Karoma and that group over there. So uh, that should be a good one as well, 141 pounds. At 152 pounds, Mike Walk the Goot takes on Ray Barlow out of Raleigh, North Carolina. Uh, Hector Soto at 123 pounds takes on Javon Campbell out of Raleigh, North Carolina. Tommy Avalar out of Germantown, Maryland, will take on Nicole, Nicholas Sullivan at, of Portsmouth, Virginia. Uh, Jenk Plana out of Hagerstown, Maryland, will take on Jonathan Housen at Virginia Beach, Virginia. That's at 178 pounds. Uh, Cortez Dunstan out of Baltimore will battle Leander Overby of Hampton, Virginia. And Jonathan Surratt of Fort Washington, Maryland, is at 201 pounds. And quite frankly, he's still looking for an opponent for him. Uh, he's not going to be unopposed. I'm, I've been told that they're still looking for an opponent for Surratt at 201 pounds. So that's the um, that's the open division uh, sort of run down there. Now, as far as the uh, novice division, not a whole lot there that I know of up here. A couple of good bouts here from what I see. Um, the only boxer out of Delaware that'll be competing on Saturday, April 30th will be uh, Mike Crane. He's out of Smyrna, Delaware. I believe he's out of the Dog Pound Gym up there. He'll take on Darius Lard at, of Woodbridge, Virginia. That'll be at 152 pounds. Okay? So that, that's one there. Uh, Leroy Payne out of Oxon Hill, Maryland. Take on Kari Clint Scales of Centerville, Centerville Virginia. I think mean, I've seen Clint Scales a few times. Uh, Leonard Poe out of Fort Washington, Maryland. Battles Dantes Blue of Durham, North Carolina. Uh, Thomas Modinger out of C. Oh, I'm sorry. There's another person out of Delaware. Excuse me. Thomas Modinger is out of Seaford, Delaware. He'll take on Gregory Saunders of Durham, North Carolina. Uh, Jimmy Spiros out of Great Falls, Virginia, 201 plus pounds. Battles Trey Gaines of Lynchburg, Virginia. Uh, Marcus Johnson, 123 pounds. Battles Ian Holman of Fairfax Station, Virginia. Blaze Fiedler, who fights out of Andrews Air Force Base, uh, takes on Nestor Rodriguez Sanchez of New Bern, North Carolina. And we have one, two regional champions, uh, not uh, already uh, two um, unopposed champions, Devontae Lee out of Waldorf, Maryland at 108 pounds, and Dante Lovelace of Cheltenham, Maryland at 200 and, uh, at, I'm sorry, at uh, 114 pounds, are already unopposed regional champions. So that's the quick rundown and, reca- and uh, preview of the Regional Golden Glove takes place at Rosecroft Raceway on Saturday, April 30th. So we got something for amateur lovers. We got something for pro lovers on that day. So uh, a lot of stuff going on. A um, couple things also. We got a lot of uh, big-time boxers coming into the area uh, to train for big bouts. 
And we've learned that Austin Trout, former uh, world champion, he is training for his title shot against uh, Jamal Charlo um, coming up at the uh, Cosmopolitan Las Vegas. And uh, you can find out more about that on uh, my buddy Juan Marshall's blog at programfighttalk.blogspot.com. Austin Trout is no stranger to this area. He's trained here a number of times for big bouts, and he's got a big one against Jamal Trout. That'll be... uh, for Charlo's Dream Midway Championship, May 21st at the Cosmopolitan in Las Vegas. So uh, that's me there, and he's training here. Or he, of course, Adrian Bronner trains here uh, for big bouts when he has them. If he will have them anytime soon, we don't know, but we'll see. Uh, so that's going to be interesting there. And a couple of changes to the card May 14th at the... Uh, at the Maryland State Fairgrounds in Timonium, Maryland, because we'll, we'll hopefully have the live broadcast of that card coming up from Maryland State Fairgrounds on that night. We've learned that Sharif Rockman will not be on this card. He was scheduled to be on the show, but uh, what was called Unforeseen Circumstances, he will not be on that card on May 14th. Should be a great card, though, because we have two uh, Maryland State title bouts. Uh, Travis Reeves will take on Larry Pryor for the Maryland State Light Heavyweight Championship. And Terrell Samuel will be uh, fighting for the Super Featherweight Championship. And that'll be on May 14th as well. And just escape me who he's facing that night. <laughs> so it's pardon, pardon me about that. But uh, yes, he'll be on that card as well uh, on May 14th. Uh, Terrell Samuel against Joshua Dynamite Davis. That'll be for the Super Featherweight Championship. Maryland Super Featherweight Championship. Tyra Shea Douglas on that card as well. So again, as we say every week, a lot going on. Some big things going on in the Beltway region. Now before we go, um, this is... Totally off the boxing subject, so so bear with me on this one. Um, if there's anything, any sport that I love anywhere close to boxing, it is college basketball. And just today, as we record this, we learned that truly one of the greatest point guards that I've ever seen in college basketball passed away at a, at a very young age. In fact, the same age that I am. And he also, ironically, had a brain tumor. That's why I'm glad that uh, Avando's brain tumor was found before his bout against Alantis Fox. Of course, we're talking about Dwayne the Pearl Washington. Now, growing up in D.C. all my life, in, in the D.C. area all my life, I was a huge Georgetown fan. In fact, in the 80s, and then let me just say this quickly as an aside, um... The 80s were a major time for college basketball in the D.C. area. Everybody seemed to have a good team that time. Okay. Georgetown in the 80s went to three national championship games in four years. And Willie became were, were three points away from winning three national championships in four years. Okay. And then the one they lost, one they weren't involved in, was North Carolina State, whose three best players we're all from the D.C. area. Sidney Lowe and Derek Wittenberg went to DeMatha and Thurl Bailey, who went to Bladensburg High School. They were the key cogs in that magical run for North Carolina State. Howard had a great team. Howard was, was had the, the remnants of the Dunk Patrol. That was uh, James Ratton, Rodney Wright, um, uh, Larry Spriggs, those guys in the 80s. You had UDC. University of the District of Columbia, who had a team that won the Division II National Championship in 1982, came back the next year and went back to the final game. American had a great team. Of course, American in 1984 knocked off Georgetown. I'm sorry, 1985. Excuse me. No, I'm sorry. That's earlier. 1982, uh, when Virginia fought, uh, took on Georgetown, Ralph Sampson versus Pat Ewing. The next night that Georgetown played, they got knocked off by an unheralded American team. Gordon Austin, Juan Jones, and those guys. Maryland, of course, had Lynn Bias during that time frame. And they had a great team. You know, George Washington played well. I mean, we, we just had we just had great basketball, college basketball, all throughout. But the team that really set the standard in the area was Georgetown. And Georgetown's number one rivals during that time period were they were then called the Orange Men 
of Syracuse University. And of course, the main cog with the orange was Dwayne Pearl Washington. And the battles that Syracuse and Georgetown used to have during that time frame are indeed the stuff of legends. And the reason why the Big East is for many people still today, the best college basketball conference in the country. They're not as good as they used to be, but they set a standard for how basketball, collegiate basketball was supposed to be played, especially in the 80s. And Dwayne Pro Washington was at the head of that. Just a remarkable play. Well, for those who don't know, Dwayne Washington died today of a brain tumor, cancerous brain tumor that he's had um, for about a year, a little over a year now. And he was only 52 years old. And as I said earlier tonight, I was diagnosed with a with a benign brain, brain tumor. And I'll be 53 my next birthday. So this saddened me for so many reasons. And, you know, we, we talk about the safety in boxing. And we talk about, you know, when should a fight be stopped? And, and we complain sometimes when bouts aren't stopped. We complain sometimes when bouts are stopped. We can't have it both ways. And I know it's going to be hard, you know, to get out of that routine. But I I think we have to look twice when we sit, we deal with situations with that. We got, we have, the big concussion thing is is so much in this, in this country now. You're hearing about uh, football players retiring very early. And of course, there's a story that Conor McGregor, the MMA fighter has retired. We don't know how true that is, but, you know, people are trying to get out while they're getting this good. So when we go back to what we talked about Gary Russell Jr. early on today, that Gary Russell Jr. may want to only fight four or five more times to get out. That may be better than we think. You know, we may come to a point where folks in contact sports may not stay as long as, as you know, at, when I say contact, hard contact sports may not stay as long as we'd like them to do. Because we are in situations now where this concussion thing is getting bigger and bigger and maybe scaring people. But I think we I think it's scaring us with knowledge because we seem to know more about the situation. And we can better diagnose when we have them and better take care of them. So we have to understand that as a, as a society now, things have changed. And it's going to be interesting to see. But Dwayne Pro Washington, even though I was a Georgetown fan, he's one of my favorite players to watch. This guy was incredible. And we're going to miss him. No question about it. Sad situation. So, you know, rest in peace. Legendary Dwayne the Pearl Washington. That'll do it here for another edition of Boxing Along the Beltway. Our news and notes. And remember, we've got the big cards coming up. Saturday, April 30th, D.C. Army for the pro show, Rosecroft Wesley for the amateur show. Make sure you can join us for at least one of those situations. I'll be at the uh, pro show coming up on April 30th. Look forward to seeing you there. Until then, I'm Gary Digital Williams reminding you as always, keep supporting the best boxing in the world, the boxing along the Beltway. Take care.